Amen, amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and this is the final message in this series on sanctification. As you're turning there, I want to remind you that what is sanctification? Sanctification is a work of God's free grace where we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. That's what we've been studying carefully in chapter 6 through 8 of Romans. And Lord, may the Lord help us as we seek to unfold this last section of God's Word. <clears throat> Romans 8. I'm going to read the whole context, 28 to 39, these 12 verses. And by the way, it's been said that these 12 verses are some of the most powerful in all of Scripture depicting the love of God. We immediately think of God is love, 1 John 4, 8. We also think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. <clears throat> but in this passage here, it's often neglected, but it's probably the most powerful in laying out the undying love of God for his people. So we want to look once more, and especially verses 31 to 39 in our time together. But notice now, beginning in verse 28. <clears throat> and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. <clears throat> for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? <clears throat> if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Powerful. If that doesn't cause you to jump up and down, I, nothing will. So powerful. Let's pray and ask God to seal this in our hearts. Lord, we've been thankful for the study in sanctification in Romans 6, 7, and 8. We've been bought out of slavery. We've been renewed and caused to fight the good fight of faith, to struggle against remaining sin with the power of thy Holy Spirit indwelling us. Thank you, Lord, for a realistic assessment of the Christian life. This is not a life in which everything is a game and fun and games. It's a war. Help us, Lord, to draw our strength from you. We're not strong enough. 
We need your grace, your help, your mercy. We thank you that you're at work in us, both to will and to work for your good pleasure. Lord, thank you for your prayer ministry for us, your example to us. We give you all the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> As I mentioned, 1 John 4, verses 7 to 10. But what I want to do real quick here before we unpack this whole section, I want us just to have kind of a quick overview of chapter 8 itself. Notice here, first of all, the first, and there are, there are seven solid evidences that we know God is for us, not against us. We're going to focus on the last section today, but I want to give you seven before the eighth, which is my message in verses 31 to 39. But by way of introduction, the first thing I want us to see it is the first solid evidence that we know God is for us, not against us, verses 1 through 4 of Romans 8. The divine act of justification assures us of this. He has declared in the high court of heaven that all who know him and love him are not guilty and not under condemnation because they're in Christ Jesus. Secondly, in verses 5 through 14 of Romans 8, we see the divine control of the Holy Spirit in our lives as an evidence that God is for us not against us. If you are a professing believer, then you must understand, I trust you do, and you've experienced this, but you sense the work of the Holy Spirit in your life in convicting and in building you up and guiding and leading you. If you know what I'm talking about, that's an evidence, a demonstration that God is for us, not against us. A third one is this, the gift of his of our sonship or our adoption into the family of God. Verses 15 and 16. Notice the language here where Paul says, For you do not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. We are the adopted children of God. Of God, Do you love God? Well, if you love God, you've been, that's been produced in you, and then your response is a great love for God as an adopted child of His. In verses 17 to 25, we see the divine assurance of glory. We're at the end of that great chain of redemption in verse 29. In 30, particularly 30, it says, In whom he justified, he also glorified. It says, good as done. It hasn't happened yet, this day of glorification. That will be at the end of history, in the final demonstration of the resurrection of the quick and the dead. But when it happens, it's only because it was once guaranteed. Way before that. The fifth evidence that God is for us out of Romans 8 and verses 26 and 27, the divine ministry of intercession by the Holy Spirit. And we talked about that a few weeks ago, the Holy Spirit in verses 26 and 27, where it says this, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Surely you know what I'm talking about when you are prompted to pray and to pray about everything. Who prompts you? Is it your bright idea? Is it something that somehow because you're closer than other people to Jesus in your estimation that somehow you have an inside track that, that you know, this really you, that God's letting you have access to him. No, it's God who's alive in you, 
awakening you and moving you to pray. That's what he's saying here. When I heard the news of my son's stroke, I groaned. And I, I, I tried to put it all together. And then wrestling with it and leaving it before God. And then before I could even pray, the groanings too deep were there and the Holy Spirit was ministering to me. I know what that is like, don't you? God, the Holy Spirit, is a testimony that God is with us and for us. The sixth evidence, verse 28, God's providence. Notice, again, the language in verse 28. And we know, notice the assurance, we know that for those, notice it's not for everyone, it's not for every religious person, but if you've repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ alone and you're resting in his righteousness alone and your hope of glory is the work of God alone, if that's you, then you can say with me and totally embrace it and we know that for those who love God, particular people who love God, all things work together for good. I know my son's stroke is going to work together for good. Why? He loves God. Whether he's 100% recovered or not, it's irrelevant ultimately. But he's resting in Christ. We are too. And we'll look to God and his will is best. We're praying for healing. We believe God heals. But he may not heal in the way we think. That's okay. We'll trust him and rest in him. And he'll give grace to those whom he loves. He'll work all things together for good. For the good of his people. For according to his will. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, Father, but thy will be done. That's what we say with Jesus Christ. And we see that for those who are called according to his purpose, to his decree, to his predestinated plan. God's not looking down the corridor of time, friends, trying to figure out who's going to pick him. And then he's trying to pick that person to be on his team. That's an atrocity. God's not some weak savior who's hoping he set the table and invited everybody and biting his nails to wonder who's going to make the right decision. That's very grievous. If that's in your thinking, erase it right now and repent. He's God, God of very God. Verses 29 and 30. The divine chain of redemption assures us that God's will will be done. Notice here he says, for those whom he foreknew, verse 29, he also predestined. There's the pre-love relationship. This word prognosko in the Greek taken from the Hebrew word yada, it means it's the same word used in the Old Testament of sexual intercourse between a husband and wife. It's, a, it's an intimate love relationship. In the Greek, it means, again, intimate love. Not just, I love you, baby. It's an intimate and, and inexplicable. It, it's, it's so intertwined and so beautiful. And the love, and notice, he loved us knowing in his ultimate plan that we would fall in his decree and he would permit his son to come to die for a people. All that, he loved us in a pre-love relationship in such a way as only God can do, and then on that basis, he predestined us. And then predestined us, and then he called us in history. In other words, election doesn't save anybody. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Election assures you will be saved, but there's got to be evangelism, there's got to be world missions to go bring in the elect from the four corners of the earth. And so those whom he predestined, he also called. Those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. That chain cannot be broken. 
That chain simply cannot be broken. So we're back to this question again. How do we know if God is for us and not against us? It's because of what the Bible says He's done. This chain of redemption. This foreknowledge for loving. This predestination. Jonathan Edwards was called the predestinating predestination evangelist. There was no controversy there with predestination and evangelism. Controversy at all. We're not God. We don't know who the elect are, but we know this. Everybody out there is potentially the elect. Therefore, we share the gospel with all men. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good. Notice here, <clears throat> if, we, if our starting point is that we believe God is for us because we got a raise last week, that should shock you. If that's your reason why. If you say to yourself, I know God can't be for me because I've been trying to get pregnant for years. So he must not be for me. Don't, don't, don't go there. Because circumstances are never to be the situation by which you measure if God is for you or against you. You might say, well, I, got a, I didn't get the raise that I was hoping to get at work. God must be against me. No. You might say, well, the house that we have is really costing us a lot of money. It's been a, a challenge. We, we hesitated whether we should even buy the house, and now it's sinking us financially. God must be mad with me. He's not for me. No, no, no. I can give you illustration after illustration, story and example of example. I think we all know where this is going. Your circumstances don't determine whether God is for you or against you. Whether you're healthy or unhealthy. That's not following the Bible. You know how you know God is for you? The chain, the golden chain of redemption. Those whom he foreloved, he also predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he justified. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. That's how you know God is for you, not against you. Have you repented and believed the gospel? Well, yes, then you're justified by faith. And those whom he's justified, he's glorified. Change your thinking if your thinking is ensnared in this way. Let's look at our first point here. We want to see then carefully then. What then shall we say to these things? Verse 31 and 32. If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? What's, what's being talked here is what's known in logic as an off, off fortiori argument. In other words, if he's done the greatest to you, toward you, then he'll surely do the lesser. Now what's the greater here? The greater is this, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son. That's the greater. If he didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, we who repent and believe the gospel, how will he not also with him in grace freely give us all things? What are the all things? The all things are foreknowledge, pre-love relationship, inseparably linked to predestination, inseparably linked to calling, inseparably linked to justification, inseparably linked to glorification. That's the lesser. If he did the greater, did not spare his own son for us all who repent and believe the gospel, how will he not also give us all these things? Answer? No one seems excited here. You know why? Because doctrine could do one of two things. 
dry up or deliver people from the bondage? I take the latter. It sets us free. The fact that God is for us, who could be against us? Think about this. Think about this. Who can oppose us? If God has done all these things, graciously given us all these things, who cares who's against us? If we're in the Middle East and we get captured by some crazy Al-Qaeda group and they want to sever our heads, who cares? It'll get us to heaven quicker. God hasn't forsaken His people who He didn't spare His own Son for. God's calling us to look at the first of five unanswerable questions. Here it is in verse 31. Question, if God is for us, who's against us? Can't answer that. It can't be answered because there's no, there's no opponent, no opposition. There's no way it could be opposed. God ensures his people that there's no opposition. No opposition to his plan that can thwart his plan. You know, some people say, well, you know, God's given every man a free will. No, he's given men moral agents who make decisions. But their will never trumps the will of God. Go with me to Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Verse 27. Actually, 26 and 27. This is the purpose that is purposed concerning the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over all the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Answer, class, no one. Who can be against us if God is for us? Who can control God? Who can manipulate God and, and somehow overcome? You know, some people say, well, God... God uh, is in control of everything, but he has allowed salvation to be in control of you. Give me chapter and verse. Show me that man has an autonomous will that's greater than God's will. It's an impossibility. Scripture doesn't teach that. It calls men to do what they cannot do. That's what we're doing we're, when we preach the gospel, when we share the gospel, we're actually preaching to a gravestone. Th think about it. What would people think if you went out to the local cemetery, you went out in front of that gravestone and started preaching at it and calling it to come alive? Well, that's what evangelism is. It's the, the success of evangelism is marked by your obedience. Are you willing to call the dead to Christ? Or is it got to all work out for you? Isn't God the one who raises the dead? It says in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, notice in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. Together with him, how did God do it? Having forgiven us all our transgressions. That's how he did it. Well, how did he do that? He didn't spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, and therefore, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, on the cross, when he said, it is finished, it was. He had secured the salvation of everyone who would believe. Not simply made salvation possible, contingent upon someone making the right decision. That means he didn't save anybody. 
actually. And he doesn't know who is going to get saved. He's there wondering and hoping that somehow, some way, someone's going to make the right choice since he gave up the will to men. Sounds nice. It's not the Bible. Amazing love. Oh, what sacrifice. It's an amazing love. Amazing love. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. How successful was this death on the cross? John 12, verse 31. Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. I believe that, do you? He's drawing all people from every kindred, tribe, people, and nation. Revelation 5, 9. Revelation 7, 9. He's, pulling every, he's drawing them all these people to himself. Why? Because he was lifted up in the resurrection from the dead. And he's drawing sinners to himself. And the judgment of this world has come upon him. What, what was the judgment? The ruler of this world was cast out. What is he referring to? At the cross, the devil was defeated. That's what he's saying. Go with me to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Let's talk about the defeat here for just a moment. I just read to you verse 13, having forgiven us all our trespasses, 2.13. Now watch. How did he do it? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. Done. He secured a people for his own possession. That's you if you're here today and you've repented and believed the gospel. That means there's a guaranteed harvest out there amongst the nations. A guaranteed harvest. That means God sends forth His people to reap the harvest. It's guaranteed they're waiting to hear the gospel. And they'll respond to the gospel. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? This is an unbreakable, inseparable chain. He who began the good work in us will perfect us until the day of Christ. Notice the second unanswerable question. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? It's going to happen. Again, as I said earlier, if he's done the greater, he'll do the lesser. The greater is, he did not spare his own son. The lesser is, he's secured it from beginning to end. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. Secondly, God's love for his people ensures them that there's no condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Quit condemning yourself. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God no longer condemns his people. It says in John chapter 3, notice on the heels of John 3.16, which I've already quoted this morning, notice here how he affirms this section here where it says, again in verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Now notice with me, chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, affirming this, right on the heels of John 3, 16, where he says this, For God, this is Jesus speaking, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
His mission wasn't one of condemnation. His mission was one of salvation. His intention is to grab his people for his own possession. There's, there are no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. God declares that the elect eternally are guiltless, no longer under condemnation. The elect, that is, those who believe. I've actually talked to people who say, I don't believe in the doctrine of election. It doesn't seem fair. Uh, there's different ways to look at it. Well, it's used all over Scripture, but let me just look at one, show you one before I show you another. In Luke 18, in the parable of the persistent widow, it's, he's, he's showing us her great example of what it means to keep being persistent. God loves persistent prayer warriors. It's not that he has to be somehow rubbed like a genie hard enough and long enough to respond. That would be terrible to think that way about God. But he, he loves a persistent, persevering people. And notice here in verse 6, and he says, And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night. The elect, the believer, day and night cries to God. Why? Because he ought to. Where does it say that? Verse 1 of chapter 18 of Luke. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. But isn't it wonderful? He gives us the Holy Spirit to intercede for us and, and pray through us and work, in, work us out through this whole point because the elect are characterized by prayer, praying at all times about everything. Ephesians 5, 19 and 20. Constantly praying. How is your prayer life? It's a very important question. Do you live upon prayer? If not, Repent. He'll forgive you, cleanse you, and show you that you must pray at all times about everything. Pray without ceasing, says Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Pray constantly about everything. Are you praying? He gives us four reasons here why the believer can be certain that he is not condemned. Look at the reasons he gives. The first one is this, verse 34. Who is to condemn? Here's the first answer of four. Christ Jesus is the one who died. Christ's death is a, one reason. One reason why we can know that there's no condemnation against us. Look at the second one. Christ's resurrection. Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised. <clears throat> Look at the third example. Christ's exaltation, who is at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of God. He, he died, he, he was raised, and now he's at the right hand of his Father in exaltation. And then what's the fourth reason why we can be sure that we're not under condemnation as his children? Here it is. He says it. Who indeed is interceding for us. His prayer ministry. How do I know? How can I be sure that I am not condemned. If I have a bad week and I read my Bible hardly ever or pray or I, I, I fall into some struggle with sin I can't get out of my mind and I, I need to repent. I'm finding it in a wrestling am, am I, and I'm condemning myself and the devil is accusing me right and left. What do I do with that? I remember that Christ died for me, was raised for me, is exalted to the right hand of God and fourthly, he's interceding for me right now. Because the accuser of our brethren, Revelation 12.10, is accusing us day and night. And the Holy Spirit is interceding for us. God the Son is interceding for us. God is moving powerfully through these things. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect. What charge can be brought that will stick against God's people? What charge? The devil goes, look at him. Look at his life. Look at her life. To the, he says to the Father, he's demanding 
to sift their minds like wheat, Luke 22, 31, and 32. Satan's demanding permission to sift us like wheat. He's going to the Father. Look at them, accusing the brethren before our God day and night. Look at them. Look how weak they are in prayer. Look how weak they are in reading their Bibles. Look how weak they are. They've been a Christian all these years. Look at this. They're not even serving. They're selfish. They're whining about COVID. What do we do with that? Here it is. No one can bring a charge against God's elect. It's God who's already justified them. Do you hear that? He didn't justify you, declare you righteous, not guilty in the high court of heaven. He didn't do that in such a way and then said, yeah, but he should, they're not living as they should and now I, they kind of got to work their way to better standing so I could Give him another little justification. No, no, not guilty. You see, even the weakest Christian has as much justification as the strongest Christian. Because it's not contingent upon us or our circumstances. Or it's upon God who has mercy. It's God who secures the salvation of his people. It's God who keeps his people God is the one. Notice he says, God is the one who justifies. It's God, not us and our works. He justifies. He determines who his people are. He's determined what saving method would be, which is through his own son. Did not spare his own son. No excuses are to be offered. So powerful. No charges can still be made against his people. None can stick against his people. And then he goes on, he says, verse 34, who is to condemn Christ? Jesus is the one who died. Notice here the question then, who is the one to condemn? No one. Where, where's, the, where's, the, where's the person condemning? Where is he? I love what the great... Scottish Presbyterian preacher of the 19th century, Robert Murray McShane. If you've never read anything about him, you need to grab it. <clears throat> Some of the best stuff I've ever read. But th this is what he said about verse 34, what it meant to him as a minister and as a Christian when he talked about how to know that Christ is praying for him and to focus on that, he said, he said this, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Are you enthralled at the prayer ministry of Christ for you as a believer? Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling, Jude 24 and 25, and to present you blameless before him with great joy. Who's going to make you stand on the day of judgment? The way you read your Bible a lot? The way you prayed a lot? No. J Jesus, a praying, the praying Savior for his people. His death secured our freedom from condemnation, his humiliation, his resurrection, his ascension, his present intercession is what we rest in and revel in as his people. <clears throat> Notice here then, <clears throat> thirdly, God's love for his people ensures them of no separation from God's love for them. No separation. He says, who shall separate us, verse 35, from the love of Christ? Now think about this. He, he gives you a chain of different things. He just throws it out. He goes, okay, I, I know you're under great challenges and persecutions, and, but do you, he says, do you understand that that to be a Christian doesn't mean on earth 
you won't have great trials, maybe martyrdom. Look what he says, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? He, he wants them to see there's no guarantee of protection from persecution. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And he goes, shall tribulation? No. Shall distress? He didn't say, well, God's going to take away the tribulation from your life. If you're a godly Christian and God sees your effort, your diligence, and how much you serve at church, he's not going to let you get distressed. Jesus said in John 16, 33, in this world is much tribulation. Take care of overcome the world. He didn't say in this world is much tribulation, but I've zapped the devil. And he's not going to bother you anymore. No, he says, in this world is much tribulation, but take care. I've overcome the world. So shall persecution? Absolutely not. I mean, think about Paul in 2 Timothy. This is powerful. In 2 Timothy, Paul says, 4.16. Here's Paul about to get his head cut off at the Mamertine prison in Rome. Okay? Many Christians today would be depressed. Here's Paul. He said, the Lord, verse 18, the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. So what, what does the guy do who's under persecution? He said, the Lord's going to deliver me. How? Death! That's how he's going to do it. So distress, shall persecution. How about this? But, but what about famine? You know, God's really for you if he doesn't let you go under a famine. But what about all the believers who suffered in Africa under famine or throughout history in different parts of the world? Was God not a, for them? No, he was for them. With famine? Yes, with famine. Famine won't separate you from the love of Christ. Nakedness won't, se won't separate you from the love of Christ. Danger I mean, I use ADT at my house at night. But I know unless God protects me, ADT is not going to protect me. And if God wants ADT to not work that night, then that's God's will. But if I can use ADT, I'm going to use it. But I know it's God who's going to protect me. We don't say, well, the elect... They'll get saved. We won't evangelize because, well, it's already been done, the elect. No. We said he's got an elect people, and he's going to save them through, through the preaching of the word. Now I must go out and preach to all people. He says, nakedness, danger, sword, all these difficulties, challenges, suffering. Listen, suffering doesn't separate the believer from God, but rather carries them along toward the ultimate goal of glory. Indeed, 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The glory of heaven is to see Christ. See him and rejoice in him. Verse 36. As it is written, and he says, and he quotes here from Psalm 44, 22. To back his point up, he says, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. In other words, okay, we're not separated from the love of God, and all day long we're being killed. Do you know that right now people are being killed around the world? Look at, look at the voice of the martyrs. A dear brother of mine in another, in another country that I preached for in a communist country not too recent years ago, 
I won't mention because this is recorded here, but I got a private thing from him the other day, a little communique, and the, his government, the communist government right now, is cracking down on churches. And but the, he mentioned that at the end of his prayer, uh, prayer email to me. Uh, but before he mentioned that, he said, oh, we, we've had uh, a bunch of uh, baptisms, a bunch of people join the church. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, he says, I die daily. Paul said, Psalm 44, 22, we're always suffering and experiencing persecutions. So God is not, not for his people when they face challenges in ministry difficulties. First Peter 4, verse 19 says this. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. In other words, if they kill us, we arrive safely in heaven. If they slander us, we rejoice, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 11 and 12. Rejoice and be glad if they say all kinds of insults against you. Verse 37, he says, But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. We overwhelmingly conquer. We are God's conquering people. Christ is building his church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. This brings us to our fourth point. God's love for his people ensures them, ensures them absolutely of no rejection, no rejection. So he says here then, for I am sure. I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers. Notice he's sure that neither death, if he dies, life, long life, angels, in this case fallen angels, rulers, could be civil magistrates or fallen angels, nor things present, present difficulties, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. All these things that we may experience in verses 38 and 39, they may happen, but they're they're not in any way showing us that God is against us. So he says in verse 38, I am sure in the ESV. Other translations say, I am certain, I am persuaded, I am convinced, I am confident. I'm confident, I, I believe there's no rejection of, of God's people from his love. Has God rejected his people? Romans 11 one and two, no, he's not rejected his people for whom he foreknew. He said that about Israel, and he means that about Christ's people in the, who are in the new covenant, both Jew and Gentile. There was a man, a godly man, in, in 19th century Scotland. He was on his dying bed, and he called for a Bible. His name was Hugh Kennedy. And when the Bible was brought to him, his eyesight had already pretty much gone, was gone, and he told the person holding the Bible him, turn to the eighth chapter of Romans and set my fingers upon the words where it says, I am persuaded, verse 38, Romans 8, I am persuaded that neither death nor life, etc. Now, he says, as his fingers were upon those words in Romans 8, 38. And then he says, and when they told him it was without speaking anymore, he said, now God be with you all my children who are around his bed. I have breakfast with you today, but I shall sup with Jesus Christ this night. And then he died. Is it helpful to know if God's for you rather than against you? What do you think? All your fears should fall away. All, all your fears of those who would hurt you and persecute you, let them go away. Christ is praying for you. Let us be committed to the scriptures and what they teach us much about our lives. 
conclusion, verse 39. Nor height, heaven, nor depth, hell, nor any other created thing or creature, none of these entities or individuals or things shall separate us from the love of Christ. But notice here in that whole list, both lists in this chapter that I've read here this morning, not one of them mentions God in these lists of things and difficulties. And the reason why is because God alone is the one who justifies you. Period. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. God who sanctifies. God who is accomplishing his purposes for the glory of his name. Well, this study has been a helpful, I trust, study in Romans 6, 7, and 8. But here's what we need to ask ourselves in closing as believers. Do we acknowledge that this great truth about our lives, if God is for us, who can be against us? Do we appreciate the clarity of Paul through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Are we resting in the truths I've just preached, or are we now awakened to them but need to rest in them? What difference does it make in your life, whether what we've studied here, especially today, has to do with helping you in your life? What difference does it make? Well, I leave you once again with John 3, to reread it again, in John 3, 16 to 18. To take it in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Have you repented and believed the gospel? Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ alone? The Bible says if you have, there's nothing that can stand against you. God is with you, and he'll deliver you safely to heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who loves your people, and that, Lord, we so often get tied in knots because we are not resting in your finished work and all the great truths about it for your people. There's nothing that can separate us from you. Lord, but there are some in our midst who, who have not chosen to love you yet. They've not seen their sin in the light of who you are and called upon you as their Lord and Savior. Lord, would you open their heart right now, Lord, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the acceptable time. Seek the Lord while he may be found, while he's near, says Isaiah. Lord, would you save sinners? And Lord, we also want to thank you for the great joy that's ours now, that you have saved your people, and you continue to save them throughout the world, through the, each day, through each year, bring, come, bringing about your purposes for your glory. So, Lord, now as we are about to meet and receive vows from 
seven new members. We pray your blessing upon that. In Jesus' name, amen.